So, good afternoon. Um, well, it was great to hear the talks yesterday and this morning. Um, I'm not going to talk too much theoretical about uh, um, whether my work would fit in the category of art or, or science or, you know, juggle with the definitions of art. Uh, and science, uh, I will do some sort of introduction to put my work in, uh, in context and then I, I hope to take you by the hand, uh, showing work by work and just telling about it, what my inspirations were and my interest. And uh, uh, I think in the context of this conference, it's more up to you to sort of judge it and place it in this field of uh, art and, uh, and, and science and maybe uh, in the questions after we could go further into that. So let's go. Um, art in a Quantified Culture, the Analogic Database is the title of the presentation. And um, this notion of the Analogic Database um, is actually present in my work for 10-15 years um, but it was only until four years ago that I um, wanted to become uh, really aware of that and wanted to define uh, my own work uh, in this way. Uh, before that I always refused to uh, define my work. Um, but it had uh, certain advantages to sort of realize that actually um, a lot of my work are dealing um, with organizing images, information uh, and the consequences on uh, that way of organizing images and information for what we call uh, meaning or, or content of our experience. Um, let's see where we go next. So, this was um, an, something, a show, a Wunderkammer in uh, 1655. Um, I don't think it was the time when art and science were still together. I think uh, neither art nor science actually was existent in that time. So it was a pre-art and a pre-science uh, situation. Uh, but it's... Um, Interesting. From a database point of view, it's, it's uh, an interesting way of organizing um, uh, artifacts in a way that they are supposedly uh, telling uh, a story about how our world is uh, organized or how things should fit together. The problem is, however, you can imagine that after, when, when, imagine when you actually are making this, um, that you immediately halfway think, well, it could also be organized completely differently. Uh, and that by the time you finish it, you wish you had all the time in the world uh, to make the 100,000 possible combinations that are actually uh, available here and to tell the 100,000 stories that are actually possible by combining and recombining all these elements. There's now um, a way to do that, and we call that uh, a database. Um, so Lev Malowitz argued already in 2002 that the databases have become the uh, dominant cultural form of the computer age. And um, this is an uh, important notion, I mean, that he used the word cultural form. Uh, so that takes the database out of the uh, sort of technological, or, or only the technological aspect of it as an instrument. Uh, but it, it takes the database to, uh, as an alternative for a narrative uh, or as an alternative for a library or an archive. So it's a way of uh, storing information, uh, but it's also a way of reading uh, information. And if the database is dominant on the lying cultural form in our culture of storing and reading information, it is quite an essential thing it's, uh, and quite an influential thing in how we uh, address and process uh, information. Um, this, um, this 
thing called information or, or how we consider what information is um, has also changed of course in the, uh, in, in the last ages um, and I was about 18 years old when I uh, read uh, the Library of Babel by uh, George W. Borges and it's a story about an endless uh, library uh, the library is as large as the universe, so it's literally endless. And this uh, universal, uh, universal, this library, is inhabited by people, and these people are wondering what they are doing there, like we are wondering what we're doing here. And they got all these books around them, and sometimes they pick a book out of the shelves, and not most of them are complete non nonsense. Uh, but occasionally there's one word, or there's a half a sentence that makes sense, and then there's pages and pages of nonsense, and then there's another word in another language. And uh, they have the feeling that the truth must be in the books, but they have no idea where or how, uh, until somebody comes up with the idea that the library is actually endless, and that all the possible combinations of the alphabet uh, are present in the library. Uh, that means that all the books that have been written and all the books that can be written are actually present in the library. That means that also the book that explains why the people are there in the library is there. Of course, also the denial of that uh, theory. So, the, 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 this concept, at that point that they are um, surrounded with all this information um, and that um, to find out what is true or not true uh, is not that they have to look out for information, but they actually, actually have to sort of find a way to filter information because they have to find out which books are true or not true. Um, was a concept that uh, Borges introduced in 1944, and it's uh, like the first time um, I think in information history that um, the art of finding knowledge was not knowing where to find it uh, in a certain library, in a certain city on a certain bookshelf, uh, but the art of finding knowledge was uh, the art of filtering, but because we are surrounded with information. And um, so this story actually became popular in the early 90s, and uh, not coincidentally, uh, 1993 was the uh, introduction of the internet browser, uh, which sort of made people apparently uh, familiar with this kind of uh, situation. Um, so this was in 1943, I think. In 48, Clark Shannon defined uh, the bit uh, as the smallest unit, unit uh, uh, of information. Uh, the, co the quantification of information uh, had, had a much longer tradition, but this was sort of the, the final pin that sort of uh, uh, quantified information into the uh, completely. Um, so information before um, was something different than information after, um, especially from an engineering point of view. Um, meaning is irrelevant. It meant that uh, once you send information from A to B, it shouldn't matter, you know, if the message was a poem. Uh, a joke uh, or a sad story, you just have to arrive from A to B. Um, so that was a sort of different concept of information that uh, was normally in, in, in the sort of cultural concept of what information is. Another thing is, uh, the more informative information is, uh, the less information uh, there is. Uh, that means, if information is informative, it means it's structured. Uh, if information is structured, it means it has redundancy. Uh, if information has redundancy, you can compress it. So, um, uh, the bigger the chaos, the more information. That's the point of view from the engineer uh, on what information is. So, this is a sort of turn in a, a cultural concept of, of what information and, and, and how information and meaning are uh, related. Um, this was um, Illustrated uh, in, in a very large movie that uh, Charles and Ray Eames made for IBM in '53, and I show you on the code called a small bit. Dot or a dash. The current flows, it ceases to flow, it flows. It is black or white, 
It is stop or go, on or off, one or none, go or no go, or black or white. The system calls for the key to be either up or down. The code calls for a dot or a dash. The current flows, it ceases to flow, it flows. It is black or white. It is stop or go, on or off, one or none, go or no go, or black or white. The system calls for the key to be either up or down. The code calls for a dot or a dash. The current flows, it ceases to flow, it flows. It is black or white. It is stop or go, on or off, one or none, go or no go, or black or white. So this um, idea of um, uh, quantified information um, and how uh, quantified information is related to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, quality of information, content, uh, has become a central theme uh, in my work. Uh, but of course, not only in my work, I, I think basically you could say this is a central uh, theme of all poetry, uh, where uh, you know, a play with grammar, which is an abstract uh, organization of language, uh, or rhyme, which is, uh, uh, you know, absolutely not related to meaning when two words rhyme with each other. Uh, but poetry plays with rhythm, uh, grammar, uh, rhyme, and uh, by sort of formal organization of words and sentences, it plays with the derived and possible uh, um, consequences on meaning of those organizations. Um, and I have selected a small a fragment of a um, uh, movie by Verb of a man with a movie camera, um, where uh, in the Russian avant-garde in that time, uh, the notion of uh, defamiliar defamiliarization was uh, used by several artists actually. Um, it is in a way also a play with formal uh, properties uh, and it is a sort of technique that they also wrote about to re-establish meaning on uh, images or thoughts that, that already had sort of stuck and, and established meaning. So they wanted to use art to break open stuck and established meanings and they used this technique called the defamiliarization uh, to sort of create a, a visual confusion and they, they did that for instance, uh, well I show you how they did that. Uh, 
So, as the computer is an excellent tool for playing and generating and uh, visualizing formal structures, for me the database is an excellent tool uh, and an excellent uh, creative medium. Um, some people that um, inspired me along the way. Um, Jos de Mul is a Dutch philosopher. Uh, um, and he addressed it, he had, uh, had addressed several themes of, in relation to information. And one of them, one of the things I like that he wrote about engaged art, and he said, I, I would rather uh, see uh, what they call engaged art uh, addressing the politics of information uh, instead of uh, the, uh, bringing over the information uh, of politics. Uh, and what he meant was that, you know, if art wants to be engaged or uh, have a political point of view on, on how reality is being formed, it might as well engage uh, to that area where reality is being engineered, uh, which are uh, databases and, da and database analysis. Um, another thing um, that he wrote about is uh, how media are uh, outsourcing uh, human capabilities, uh, ways of outsourcing human capabilities. It's not really a revolutionary idea, but um, it starts with the idea that writing uh, basically is outsourcing uh, memory. Um, so in that respect, if you follow the history of media from writing as outsourcing of memory and the computer as outsourcing of calculating, then there's, there isn't this radical break like uh, first there were like no computers, and then there are computers now. We are sort of cyborgs the moment we started to uh, use uh, the script. Uh, um, then there's a Belgian philosopher, David van Rijbroek, and he actually talks about um, uh, um, public space. And, uh, but he talks about public space also as an organization, as something we have to relate to. And I bring that uh, into the context of informational context. So when he says we have to create context that brings out the best of persons, I translate that into how we relate to information. And it means that we have to create interfaces, computers, software, uh, interaction with information that brings the best out of us. Uh, and you can wonder whether uh, social media, uh, as they work at the moment, uh, if that is really in there. Uh, interest or uh, that there should be other parties involved in uh, designing this uh, public space. You, you could argue that public space basically equals now uh, informational context. And you cannot imagine that we, we would leave it to Google and Facebook to design the inner city, uh, but we easily accept that Google and Facebook design our informational context. So there's a, something we could be more critical on. And then uh, Van den Aals, he's a Dutch writer and artist. He actually, I, I, I used and, and, uh, this concept of uh, analogic. Uh, he wrote about this in the, in the context of uh, exhibition spaces and how in exhibition spaces information is not ordered and transformed and knowledge is not ordered and transformed through logic but rather through analogic. So by comparing things and by uh, drawing lines among objects uh, it's what Foucault refers to as uh, ideology instead of history. Uh, it's more concerned with the connections and the lines between the things than the, the stories of the individual subjects or elements of the database uh, themselves. So this is the last uh, sort of talkative, um, more abstract part, but and maybe this slide should be at the end. Um, but. So if you think about this database as a um, creative tool, uh, what kind of uh, uh, properties does it have or should it have? So one thing that is heuristic rather than deterministic. And heuristic, I don't know if you're familiar with the term, it comes from Eureka, I found it. Heuristic is a way of uh, finding things. But it's actually um, 
scientific methodology. It means when you enter a library of 100,000 books, how do you know as quick as possible what kind of library you are in? Well, it's not by starting in the lower corner and then work your way through. It's just by starting picking random books, opening up in random pages and thinking about it, uh, associating about what you see and make a best guess, and they call it an educated guess in that case. That's uh, how this informational context could work, or how this database uh, as a creative tool can work. Uh, deductive rather than inductive. Uh, Google is an inductive approach to uh, a database. So you're looking for something, and you get a lot of options in the beginning, and then you narrow down, 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 until you get the ultimate answer. Uh, but you know, the, the, if you think about the term surfing, as, as it was used in the beginning of uh, the internet, this is a very different way. You, you roam and you go from text to text, and uh, actually you get more and more and more and more options instead of less and less and less. It's a, a, a route planner more than uh, something that uh, sends you to one point. Uh, then what knowledge is? Well, knowledge in, 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 in the Creative database is reflected in poetry, in uh, aesthetic experiences. It's rather analogic. Uh, the emphasis is on correlation, association, and connotation. And there's an interesting thing uh, that I will come to talk about later, uh, because the thing that we call big data, uh, the kind of research uh, that we do to find uh, possible meaning in very extremely large uh, data sets, um, actually, uh, in that kind of research, uh, there's no hypothesis, uh, but there's a, re a research on uh, patterns and correlation, uh, which eventually lead to association, which eventually leads to uh, some sort of knowledge and, and predictions of what is in the database. It's the way secret services uh, work. Um, and then there's this. Uh, informational context, which empowers the user as an information engineer. Uh, so not the user as a user or the user as a product, uh, but the user as an information engineer. And the engineer, the word engineering uh, is related to the word engine, and the engineer is basically the boss of the machine. So we should all become or allowed to become information engineers, bosses of our uh, machines. Uh, it's a bit less passive. Okay, let's um, go back a few years, 1995. And one of my first uh, video works um, in the 90s, um, there was the first uh, introduction of what they call non-linear editing systems. Uh, basically, it was the transfer where video that was a tape-based medium ended up in the computer. And as a marketing term, they called it non-linear. Uh, but there was nothing non-linear about it, because you just had a time uh, thing, and you just dropped your footage uh, one in front of the other, so it was as linear as linear uh, can be. <coughs> and I was sort of intrigued to, by the idea and to investigate, so what could actually be non-linear editing? And to investigate that, I started to write scripts and software that worked on video and video frames and were cutting uh, video and video frames automatically. I will show a short piece of um, some product that I made from all kinds of shots that I sh uh, shot in Tokyo. And um, I was aware that I could never make you know, the movie for me about Tokyo. There were so many stories to tell. Uh, so I decided to write a script that would sort of generate endless combinations of shots uh, that would result in an endless amount of perspectives, visual perspectives of the same uh, city. Ha 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 ha! 
It was actually a small uh, script of a few lines that uh, worked on a, on a conventional uh, non-linear editing system, uh, cutting up pieces of video and just putting it on the timeline, but if I wouldn't stop it, it would go on endlessly, uh, making new uh, combinations. Um, so there were some other experiments uh, that I did in this time, and, and you will notice this is only the ball uh, done with um, uh, my own footage, so all these visuals were uh, uh, filmed by myself. I'll show you a short part of a project in Catania. So these were also basically literally explorations, you know, cities and environments. my scenes, in the scenes I gave them keywords and by writing uh, sort of poetry like, or, well you can't hardly call it poetry, but writing short sentences like tree, tree, city, Rotterdam, uh, an other name of a city, portrait, uh, clouds, I could send that to the computer and it would come back with a, uh, a series of uh, officials that were listening to those uh, uh, keywords. This is one of the work that I made with that. Then there were uh, several variables put in the work and it became a sort of uh, unstable generative visual system that sort of explored uh, visual and uh, video visuals that I uh, entered into the system. I was traveling a lot in these days, so there's countless Shots of cities and buildings and landscapes. And it has some sort of basic structure in which it you know, shows buildings first, and then it shows portraits, and then it shows landscapes. And um, the second uh, software that I developed, uh, I didn't have to name. The, the scenes, uh, but uh, it used um, uh, image analysis. So uh, it was capable of doing um, basically uh, pixel uh, statistics. Uh, it could count uh, red pixels and green pixels, and in a very basic way, 
see what a complex image was or, or a simple image, uh, uh, or one with a lot of contrast or one with less uh, contrast. And this is a work that I made from this image. It's an installation and it transforms this gallery window in a sort of moving cathedral-like uh, stained glass. The projector is inside, but the, the, the projection is not on the wood, so it feels like the, the light is coming from the outside. Um, and this move is a bit speeded up to show you the structure. Uh, in reality, it's, it's a bit more uh, meditative because the light slowly changes the whole experience of the room and is sort of endlessly building up new combinations. It's never a predictable uh, what will come uh, next. So at the Library of Babel, um, I made a work inspired by that uh, story. And uh, the work um, consists of nine uh, large uh, tiles on the floor, floor plates. And the moment you step on one of these, uh, you generate um, a query to the image database. And the image database uh, contained uh, 100,000 images, which was really uh, an enormous amount in those days. Um, and the query consists of uh, 18 uh, parameters uh, of uh, uh, pixel st statistics. So the amount of red, the amount of green, the amount of contrast, uh, uh, very abstract uh, mathematical notions like entropy and disentropy were uh, analyzed in these uh, images. And um, when you step on one of these plates, you would generate this query and all these uh, uh, parameters would be addressed randomly. So you get 18 random points on a request to the database. Um, although this uh, request is random, it's at the same time extremely sp specific because you ask for 18 very specific parameters in relation to each other. So the visual feedback is quite specific. Every stream that you generate is distinctly different uh, from every other one. So there's another sort of play with patterns and uh, generating structures and uh, inviting people to associate and reflect on the This idea of the database and, and, and ordering and, and reordering sort of got more hold on me. I also started to realize that this isn't actually only related to you know databases as databases in the computer, but much more as a way of thinking about uh, information uh, and uh, so more a, a cultural phenomenon, like how we address information as a cultural and as a cultural given. <coughs> Um, so I started also to experiment with sort of low-tech databases and database approaches. And in 2004, I was asked to make a short movie about Warsaw uh, when Poland entered uh, the European community. Uh, and I 
as well. Just like in Tokyo, I cannot go into that city and make the movie about Wash Out. Uh, I can make a very uh, um, I can make a small narrative of me visiting that city, but what is the point? Um, and I, I, I had noticed before in Rotterdam, the city where I live, um, that in the window of photographers, portrait photographers, you see these photos. That's, that these portrait photos are so site specific that you could drop me in Rotterdam uh, at one of the front of one of these windows, and by only looking at the portraits, I could tell you whether I was in south, north, or east, or west. It would be, for me, distinguishably different. Um, so I realized that there's a lot of information, um, cultural information, very specific, uh, uh, actually collected in just simple uh, portrait photography. And portrait photography is very minimal, I mean, it's just this. So where do you get it from, you know? It's just the haircut, it's just the color of the, of the blouse, it's just the, the makeup, it's how they look. It's very minimal, but it's very present. Um, so uh, I decided to use that as a starting point, collect these images, and um, after I came back, I was experimenting with uh, ordering these images in, in all kinds of you know, colors and uh, just formal properties. In the end, I just decided to order them from young to old, which is, after all, also a sort of very simple formal rule. And um, that resulted in this um, movie.
So, of course, there was a lot of uh, editing and, and, and trickery and music, and it's not as formal as I uh, presented it, but it sort of proves the point in a way. Um, a similar project that presented me with a problem of sort of uh, an environment and a representation of that uh, environment, in this case it was uh, India. Uh, this is the Dutch embassy in India. Um, and uh, I was invited to, to make a temporary work on the, on the ceiling of, that, uh, of the embassy, uh, representing India, but how, you know, how can I uh, represent India? Uh, so I decided to fall back on the uh, UNESCO uh, list of uh, cultural uh, heritage, uh, also because it was inside the embassy and it was sort of a political, uh, very sensitive that if I would select more mosques than shrines that there would be uh, possible potential problems. Um, so I, I had to fall back on a sort of unexpected, uh, unsuspected uh, source. Um, so I, I collected all these pictures of uh, the cultural heritage of um, India and also organized it in, uh, according to formal properties and let the computer generate a square, building up a square every time a new square. Uh, selecting new images from dark to light, from purple to red, uh, from low contrast to high contrast, and combinations of them. And actually, the square is uh, multiplied four times, so it's four times the same uh, square, which creates a sort of ornament in the middle, which generates uh, swastika types of uh, uh, patterns, which are quite typical for instance for uh, Indian uh, temples. And then on the side, there's the sort of linear uh, setup of information, which was uh, sort of symbolizing uh, the West. So in this project, Match of the Day, I worked with, I continue to work with image analysis, and um, as a source, I used uh, satellite television. I had a computer tapping uh, 30 international uh, satellite television channels, um, collecting little pieces of video that were regarded as images. And then I had the computer doing analysis on those images, uh, like 40,000 images in the database, which equals into, uh, I think, 60 million cross comparisons every night. And then that system would produce a list, and on top of the list were uh, well, the identical images, which were quite boring because they were identical. But if you scroll down the list, the images slowly start to differ, and you would end up in a category where actually sort of what we call content was being generated, because the images would differ enough to be different uh, and close enough to suggest a meaning. So uh, this is a selection of uh, some of these uh, findings. And the interesting thing is whenever, you know, humor or uh, politics or uh, opinionated uh, suggestions are being presented there, uh, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. I didn't generate any content here. Of course, I was the uh, editor. I selected the ones that I found most interesting. But I didn't generate uh, the combinations between the two. And this is another experiment that sort of shows uh, very clear how, uh, how computers do look. Uh, 
and uh, you probably see the, the two floors. Uh, but you can also imagine that for a computer they are completely identical. They are the same <coughs> things. This was another project, um, sort of thinking about this database and then uh, the database in relation to the archive. Uh, so what is the archive and how is the archive different from the database? It was a project in the cultural uh, uh, capital uh, that was in that year, uh, the Ruhrgebiet in Germany. Um, and I explored uh, several uh, uh, archives, city archives. Um, and looking for images that represented uh, the technological uh, evolution in that area, because basically the whole development of that area, uh, cultural development of that area, equals uh, technological and industrial development. So also uh, at the end of it, when after the industrial period and at the start of information uh, culture, they uh, lost uh, everything, uh, which made them very sad places actually to visit. Um, but I sort of wanted to trace back into that history and, and maybe a bit optimistic with this whole thought of defamiliarization, recombining things from the past and, and trying to generate sort of new openings and new ways of thinking about that past. So maybe that could result in new ways of thinking about a future or a possible future. Um, this is very low tech. These are uh, a collection of all the towers I could find in the archive. And then I put uh, the different towers in different colors on the print. And uh, by using different colors of light on that print, uh, I could show different uh, towers. Uh, so it's just normal LED light and it's a normal uh, print. Uh, but let's say you put it, print one tower in red and the other one in green. If you then put red and green line on it, you can show either one or the other. So it was sort of the most low-tech and minimal way also to make a, to create a, a moving a printed image. And uh, then there were like uh, 20 different uh, images on the floor. All generating this kind of juxtaposed uh, images from the from the city archive. Excuse me. Where does the light come from? Uh, from the lampposts. So uh, the lampposts are already there, and I had killed uh, the original lights, and instead uh, there was a LED uh, spot in the lamppost. So here you see uh, something: the minor history uh, of mines in that area and the last minute uh, offer from a travel agency which is a bit of a morbid combination of course so this idea of the database and, and, and navigating as a navigating system uh, came to another point in the um, uh, work that I made for the, the Museum of Photography, the Dutch Museum of Photography and they had a collection of 100,000 negatives and they asked me if I could sort of disclose this collection uh, publicly uh, in an interactive way and also in a way that would stimulate uh, social uh, interaction. And so therefore I had designed uh, four posts separately that interact with the whole database. But every post uh, represents a specific filter. So there's a who, the name of the photographer, uh, a date, a when, uh, a theme, a what, uh, and a where, a location. So people who enter this system, they start with 100,000 images, and if they select either a date or a place or a name, they narrow down this selection. Uh, but their neighbor, left or right, also gets presented with this narrow down selection. So if you choose the city of uh, Singapore, uh, you only get uh, the dates in the next post that are related to all the pictures in Singapore. But that means that the next, picture, the next person can actually select a day from that, uh, and uh, the third person uh, can select, for instance, a photographer. So this way you get very specific 
sort of navigation routes inside this uh, uh, database and sort of very uh, unexpected uh, combinations of images, which again uh, are uh, unexpected but, but very coherent in a way because they are very uh, they are from a specific photographer in a specific time in a specific uh, place from a specific subject in the end. Uh, but it's sort of ultimate, I think, heuristic approach to uh, an information that you know bears a hundred thousand or plus images. I quickly skip to the last um, work that I'm currently working on. One second of this, which is taking this idea of the, you know, I explored the archive as a database. This is exploration of the collection, the collection of paintings, but then in a sort of database form. So if a collection of paintings, the exhibition form is to put it into three-dimensional space and make the exhibition, uh, the database form of a collection of paintings could be an interaction, actually. There's a lot more to say, of course, about this uh, work, but uh, we move on. Uh, this is a live performance which is uh, uh, based on something that comes closest to this uh, notion of uh, big data in my work, because it literally works with uh, uh, millions of images uh, that are being uh, collected randomly then analyzed with image analysis software and then organized into sort of stop motion, little stop motion animations. So every image becomes a frame in a little stop motion uh, animation. The, the, the system starts to build uh, yeah, little um, clips, movies, animations, however you want to call it, from this huge uh, data set. And then in a live uh, setting with a musician. So the last project, I am in, sorry, in the last minute, um, is what I'm currently working on. It's a collaboration with the Dutch. Um, uh, television archive and uh, it's a project that I have um, started and I have sent it to them and they are uh, happy to collaborate uh, with me on this. It's an investigation of the uh, archive of the Dutch televised uh, news uh, over the last 30 years. So they have an archive of 30 years of television news and I want to explore that television news uh, using semantic analysis on that news uh, in an interactive uh, and, and, and sort of uh, disclose that in an interactive uh, setting. So here's the methodology that um, will lead in the end to uh, work. Um, first, this, all these spoken words they get to uh, they get. Uh, I use uh, speech-to-text software, which uh, can uh, transfer the speech into written text. On the written text, I can do automatic uh, topic finding, and on the topics, then I can do semantic analysis. It means that, for instance, when the word rain, or the subject, the topic rain, is being recognized, I can measure which other subjects are, within time, of course, closely uh, close to that word rain. So in the 70s, that would be more uh, probably sour or acid rain. Uh, and in the 90s, that would be more like a global warming uh, kind of rain, or maybe tsunami kind of uh, rain. So in, in, the, in this setup, you could explore um, uh, the connotation of the word rain uh, through the years, or the connotation of the word uh, uh, foreigner, or the connotation of the queen, uh, or the connotation of uh, a political party or whatever. So you, the idea is that you can follow sort of trends or connotations uh, which are sort of, let's say, cultural conventions about what a word actually means and how it changes uh, over time. 
So it's a typical uh, methodology where you go from a quantitative, a complete quantitative approach that somehow during the process turns around uh, and, and uh, ends up in, in something, you know, you start with semantics and you end up with connotation. Where semantics you can calculate, connotation is something much more cultural and, and, and fuzzy. I'll just show you the first tests. So here's the semantic cloud you can use to browse. You can tick a word and then the other subjects that are related to it will organize it around. Uh, we don't have 30 years, we have now 3 years, so these are the 3 years. And this is the time you are researching. And this is Europe, and if you move this, you investigate the semantic relations of Europe over time from the database. And this is the last test set up I did just a week ago. I'm sort of amused how it officially relates to my very early uh, experiments with, uh, with video and, uh, and scripts. So uh, this is the uh, exhibition uh, design that will be shown uh, in a month's time from now. Uh, but then I have uh, another year or so to uh, include uh, uh, the other 27 years of news into the database. So that concludes my talk.